And I call on Michael Matheson. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement to all those within the Chamber and those outside who have raised awareness of concerns surrounding the provision of forensic examination services to victims of sexual crime. Rape and sexual assault are the most horrendous of crimes. They can rob victims of their self-esteem and dignity, and the effects last long after the original offence has been committed. The need to treat victims of crime sensitively is never more acute or important than with those who are victims of a sexual offence. Last year, I had the privilege to meet the author of A Woman's Story. Members will be aware that A Woman's Story is a powerful narrative of one woman's very personal and traumatic journey through each step of the justice process after she had been raped. As Cabinet Secretary for Justice, it's vital that I hear firsthand how an individual can be made to feel when they come into contact with the criminal justice system. That meeting with a very brave woman and the observations she made have stayed with me. Official statistics show an increase in reported sexual crime in recent years. This is consistent with increasing confidence on the part of victims to report crimes and a robust approach by police and prosecutors to bring perpetrators to justice. However, whilst convictions for sexual crimes are at an all-time high, it is critical that we understand that a successful prosecution is not the only outcome that matters. Many victims will be on a long journey of recovery, which continues well beyond the conclusion of a court case. It's therefore crucial that the healthcare response is equipped to deliver the services that they need. Often, this begins with the forensic medical examination. As a government, we have committed to driving forward improvements for victims within this parliamentary term. In particular, the 2016 SNP manifesto undertook to review how forensic examinations are carried out to ensure that they are done appropriately and sensitively. We know, for example, that the majority of victims would prefer to be examined by a female doctor. We know that the current gender balance of doctors with the necessary training does not offer that choice. A course designed by NHS Education Scotland for the Scottish legal system exists, but the uptake from female doctors is low. There is currently only 19 female forensic physicians working in Scotland. We took forward work in partnership with NHS Education Scotland to understand why. This included a national survey of doctors issued in February to gather information about the perceived barriers to working within this area. Over 800 responses were received and over half said they would, in principle, be interested in working to provide forensic examinations for victims of sexual crime. 17 doctors proactively followed up the survey requesting further information about how they could get involved. That already is a positive outcome and discussions with NHS Education Scotland and health boards will inform further actions to address the issue more sustainably. In addition, on the same month, we announced the commissioning of national standards to be developed by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. The national standards will be the first published national standards for forensic examinations for victims of sexual assault. These standards will put beyond doubt what is expected of NHS boards in delivering care for victims and will build consistency of practice throughout the country. We want to ensure that where a victim reports a rape, that they are given the best care, no matter where in the country they are. We also think it's important that victims are made aware of the standards themselves and understand that forensic examinations is only one part of a much wider package of healthcare that they are entitled to. The National Standards for Forensic Examination will be consulted on this summer 
and published by the end of the year. Signing officer, members of this chamber will have read the recent Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary Report on Forensic Examination Services, which point very clearly to improvements that we need to make. It found significant variations in the provision of forensic medical services in Scotland. It recommended that a better balance should be achieved between the justice and health response to appropriately address the immediate health care needs and future recovery of patients. And it reported that some victims still require to attend police buildings to undergo an examination. This is completely unacceptable. As a general theme, the report found a lack of strategic leadership and governance over provision of forensic medical services. On the 30th of March, the same day HMICS report was published, the Scottish Government announced that the Chief Medical Officer would lead a group of key individuals to galvanise the necessary leadership within health and justice to transform healthcare response to victims of sexual crime. On the 27th of April, I addressed the first meeting of this task force. The task force for the improvement of services for victims of rape and sexual assault has a clear mandate from Scottish ministers. To improve, to provide national strategic governance and to take decisions that will make a tangible difference for victims. It has a strong membership, including Police Scotland, Crown Office, Rape Crisis Scotland, representation from NHS Chief Executives, Royal Colleges, Child Protection Committee, NHS Chairs and the Chief Social Work Advisor. The task force has identified five working groups to sit under it and chairs are nominated for each under the following headings. Workforce planning, regional delivery of services, clinical pathways, quality improvement and premises and infrastructure. Sign officer, this chamber should be in no doubt that Scottish ministers have empowered this task force through the CMO's leadership to be bold and to deliver. Working groups have been tasked to agree their remit and priorities for the next task force meeting in June. And Scottish ministers will be receiving regular progress reports. The Chief Medical Officer will also establish a task force work plan and that this will be published over the summer to communicate clearly how that work will be driven forward. Also, before I finish, I want to raise particular concerns about the provision of forensic examinations in rural and island communities. I met with Liam MacArthur and Tavi Scott in March to discuss provision of forensic examinations in Orkney and Shetland which have no local service currently operating for victims. I share the concerns raised about current provision of forensic examinations for victims of sexual assault in island communities. And I can give my assurance now, as I did then, that the Scottish Government is committed to making meaningful changes to rectify this situation. Since that discussion, I'm pleased that Shetland Health Board has announced plans for a local victim-centred service to provide forensic examination and compassionate medical health care on the island. This, President Officer, is a very encouraging development. President Officer, we are aware that much more requires to be done and that the challenges are many. I know members will recognise that these issues require effective planning and appropriate training of staff over the coming period. I have confidence that the task force is the best place for these challenges to be considered, and I look forward to its recommendations in the coming months. Thank you. Move to questions. We start with uh, Donald Cameron to be followed by Claire Baker. Donald Cameron. Oh. 
have uh, no problem being confused for Donald Cameron. Uh, like the Cabinet Secretary, I wish to acknowledge the work of those who rightly uh, seek to improve the provision of forensic examination services to victims of sexual crime. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary for Scotland's re report into forensic medical services for victims of sexual crimes highlighted a catalogue of failures, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of his statement responding to this report. HMICS made clear that the provision of services in some areas was not only unacceptable, but Scotland as a whole is well behind the rest of the UK. While I note the developments the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in Shetland, can he give more information on what is happening in Orkney and when will victims on both these islands eh, expect to receive the victim-centred service on island? Furthermore, what does the Cabinet Secretary expect to change so we can see the level of service in Scotland at least match that in other parts of the United Kingdom? And finally, the Scottish Government accepts that not enough female doctors are coming forward to provide forensic examinations for female victims. Have the Government tried to understand why more than 400 people responded positively to the national survey in February that they would, in principle, be interested in working to provide forensic examinations, but only 17 have proactively followed this up? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I turn to the issues that were highlighted in HMICS uh, report, which is a very valuable report uh, and helps us to understand the extent of the challenges which we face across the country. Uh, what the report highlights is that the minimum standards which were set in 2013, which should have been taken forward by health boards, have not been implemented effectively across the country. There are areas where there is just simply not the necessary strategic leadership being led within health boards to make sure that those minimum standards were being applied. There's also a suggestion of some evidence that, uh, that uh, some health boards have interpreted the minimum standards as being the baseline of good practice that should be applied in the way in which these services should be uh, delivered. That's why I took the decision to appoint Healthcare Improvement Scotland to look at establishing national standards. So that there is no question about what standards should be delivered at a localised level and that all, all health boards are well aware of what that uh, national standard should be and what is expected of them. So the national standards will give us greater clarity and will help to deliver greater consistency. Uh, the member made reference to the uh, progress that's been made within uh, Shetland as a result of uh, doctors on the island proactively choosing to come forward and to participate in the training programme which is available for them to carry out these forensic examinations. And, uh, Liam MacArthur met with uh, myself uh, and uh, along with his colleague Tavish Scott to discuss the very concerns that he has in his constituency in Orkney and the approach that is being uh, taken there. Uh, what I can assure the member is that there is ongoing discussions around how they can improve the services uh, within Orkney uh, and meet the challenges which they do face within our island communities. Uh, that's demonstrated by the approach that's been taken in the Western Isles, where they've been able to sustain and develop a service around forensic medical examinations, including uh, being able to provide it with a female uh, doctor. So I'm confident we'll be able to make sure that we take that forward with the work that the task force is undertaking and with the new national standards which will be applied and how the services will be delivered in our island communities as well as on our mainland uh, communities. When a member asked about what can we expect to change and the approach has been taken in other parts of the UK, in particular the SARC's approach, which has been used in England and Wales. The principles of SARC, I think, are uh, well-founded. However, I'm not convinced it's in a model which is appropriate for us here in Scotland. And the reason for that is that it is a joint health justice commissioned model. Uh, what I want to see, or what we want to see, is a health-led model with the focus on the needs of the victim, with the forensic examination just being a component of that. Wrap around, wrap around healthcare for the victim is the absolute key that we require in the approach that we take forward. And in doing that, we need to take a flexible approach because the number of cases which we dealt with within the central belt will be markedly different from that in our island communities. So we need to have a model that reflects the different geographical population base that we have in Scotland, but one which is focused on the healthcare needs of the victim when they come forward. And I've got no doubt that the task force will be focused on doing that. And the Chief, <coughs> Chief Medical Officer will ensure that the model which we have is one which is sustainable in the future. With regards to the 800 who have responded to the survey, uh, in saying that, although 800 people have responded to it, um, that, is, uh, that work is still being taken forward in analysing the results. 
uh, the 17 who have proactively themselves said, I want to actually participate in the training programme, is just a number of individuals who have done that off their own back. Uh, there are many who have expressed an interest, but they want further information, and that will be pursued and taken forward. The encouraging thing is that the vast majority of those who responded to the survey were female doctors. Uh, and I've got no doubt we'll be able to increase the number of female doctors who are carrying out forensic medical examinations. Claire Baker to be followed by Sultan <coughs> McGregor. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement. And it is right that the Government come to the Chamber this afternoon with a response to what was a fairly damning HMI CDS response, showing that some victims of sexual assault have been failed by the provision and that there is a need for drastic improvement. Sadly, the failings that were identified aren't new. The minimum standards of service delivery were accepted by ministers in 2013, recognising then that improvements needed to be made. But what we, have, what we have seen over the last four years has been a lack of leadership, investment and delivery. I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's focus today, but I do stress that this is a live issue and that there are victims who are still experiencing many of these failings. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary when he expects the working group to conclude and the improvements to be implemented and how in the future services will be audited and inspected to ensure that standards don't fall behind? And finally, the HMICS report reported there is a gap in provision regarding victims who need support and medical attention but do not wish to report the attack to the police. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what action is being taken to ensure that those victims will be able to get the support that they need? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, can I pick up on the specific points that Claire Baker has mentioned, and that is the time frame around the completion of the task force uh, work. Uh, what is particularly important here is in addressing the key areas that the task force has already highlighted that the working groups will focus on is to make sure that we deliver a model which is health focused, it's sensitive, that it delivers the necessary forensic or medical examination, but also recognises the ongoing health care needs of the woman who has made access of that particular service. And we need to make sure that that's a model which is sustainable. This is not about trying to find a way in which we can just quickly fix this. We need to make sure that we have a steady flow of clinicians, in particular female clinicians, who are going into training to become uh, uh, qualified in carrying out uh, forensic medical examinations. So I'm not going to set an arbitrary time frame for the task force completing its work. And the reason why I don't want to do that is because I want to make sure that the model and the approach which is taken is one which is sustainable and it delivers the level of change, the transformation that we want to see being implemented in the way in which forensic medical examinations are taken forward in the future for victims of sexual uh, crime. But what I can assure the member of is that the task force, uh, under the leadership of the CMO, uh, recognise the urgency that is necessary in driving this forward. That's why we have given it the ability to be bold and to also be ambitious about the approach that we take here in Scotland. Uh, so although they will be taking forward detailed work over the coming months, uh, we will receive regular update reports on the progress that they're making. They will also be publishing their work programme and how that will be taken forward as well. But I would expect to see improvements starting to be made as that work has been taken forward. I'm not expecting health boards to wait until the task force has finished all of its work before they start making progress in these matters. I expect them to start making progress on it now and as we move forward with the work that will be taken forward by uh, the task force. On a specific issue of self-referral, there are some health, boards area, some health board areas where self-referral is not possible at the present time. And that's one of the key issues that the task force will be looking at, is how we can make sure that there is scope for self-referral to be available. One of the things that we do need to give consideration to is that in taking a health-based approach, is that self-referral does have some legal implications that we need to bottom out to make sure that women who do choose to report, do choose to go along for a forensic medical examination and for healthcare support that don't report it to the police, that we're able to deliver that service to them in a way that is appropriate to their needs and that is sensitive to their circumstances as well. And that's one of the issues which the task force will be taking forward in its work in, its in the coming months. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I'm just conscious we've taken nine and a half minutes to get through the first two questions. Uh, it's a very sensitive subject, but we could try and be slightly briefer in the answers and the responses. Question number one, uh, sorry, Fulton McGregor to be followed by Donald Cameron. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Given the urgency described by the Cabinet Secretary, can I ask what the next steps and the immediate steps are for the task force? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, the next immediate steps are, as I've set out in my statement, the uh, five working groups who will set up underneath the task force. The chairs have been appointed. They will now uh, be responsible for setting out their remit and priorities. That will report to the task force uh, at its June meeting. Uh, and uh, during the summer, we will also see the consultation taking place on the new national standards, which are being led on by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And at the end of the summer, we would expect the task force then to have published its work programme going forward, and we will therefore uh, receive regular updates uh, following the task force publication of its uh, work programme. Donald Cameron to be followed by Mary Evans. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given the stress on rural and island communities, especially Orkney and Shetland, which have been mentioned, um, I note from the recent HMICS report there is currently nowhere in our Gull and Butte for victims uh, to go to receive a forensic examination. They have to travel to the Archway in Glasgow, which can involve some very long distances indeed. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary make to women across Argyll and Butte that following on from this review, uh, such a service may be available within their region? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if the member uh, uh, had listened to the comments I made in my statement, that's one of the issues which the task force will be looking at, is to consider how we can best deliver services on a regional basis that uh, provide the level of clinical support that's necessary for women uh, across uh, the country. For some women uh, in the Argyll and Butte area, um, Inverness is the easier access point than the Archway is. So at the present time, the health board use both those facilities. They use part NHS Highland and they also use the Archway in uh, Glasgow. Uh, what we need to do is to make sure that we have a ser service which is also sustainable, a service which is not only meeting the healthcare needs and the forensic needs, but it's also sustainable going forward so that women in our more remote areas can access a service which is appropriate to, meet, to meeting their ongoing health care needs. And I've got no doubt the task force will be looking at what the best model is in delivering that, not just in Argyll and Butte, but in other rural parts of Scotland. Mary Evans to be followed by Mary Fee. Mary Evans. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise with, that without the support of third sector organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland, many victims couldn't engage with the, the demands of the criminal justice system? And will he make a commitment to continue to support these vital and valued organisations? Cabinet Secretary. Signing off, sir, um, third sector organisations such as Rape Crisis Scotland uh, play an invaluable role to the support that victims of rape and sexual crime uh, experience in supporting them um, from a very early stage in the criminal justice process and also beyond the criminal justice uh, process. Uh, the value of which is uh, recognised by the actions of this government. Uh, we provided an extra £1.85 million to Rape Crisis Scotland to be able to provide a greater range of services across uh, the country, both mainland and for the first time in Orkney and Shetland, where we now have rape crisis uh, services available. Uh, some of that, I also believe, has helped to demonstrate the areas where there are gaps in existing services that need to be addressed. Uh, so we recognise the invaluable role that they play. That's why they're also on our task force, uh, and we're committed to make, continuing to work with them to make sure we meet the needs of women who do experience sexual violence in our uh, communities across Scotland. Mary Fee to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The HMICS report referred to in the Cabinet Secretary's statement found that sustaining sufficient numbers of paediatricians with the relevant experience is a challenge, that due to the lack of availability of paediatric services in some areas, children who have been sexually abused are having to travel significant distances to be medically examined, and that adolescents can fall between adult and child services, and in the west of the country, when Archway is unavailable, forensic medical examinations can be delayed. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain today how he and the task force will address the issues identified by the Inspectorate, which relate specifically to children and young people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, Mary Fee raises a, raises a very important uh, point, and that's around the way in which uh, forensic medical examinations are conducted for children and young people. At the present moment, uh, the standards set that uh, a uh, person under the age of uh, 16 uh, is covered by the paediatric standards, uh, which are in draft form at the present time uh, and which have been taken forward by the Managed Clinical Network for paediatric uh, medical forensic examinations. Uh, that's uh, now being considered by the regional partners and how it will be taken forward. Uh, part of the challenge is in ensuring that we have a sufficient number of paediatricians with the required training in conducting forensic medical examinations. 
The member will recognise that HMICS in the report does acknowledge that they are broadly working well across the country at the present time. But you, uh, the member does raise an important point about the travelling distance for some uh, parts of the country. That's largely down to availability of paediatricians uh, to conduct these types of medical examinations. The standards which have been taken forward by the regional planning groups at the present time, uh, we will work with them uh, through the task force to look at how we can align the new national standards alongside the paediatric standards to ensure there's a consistency of approach uh, and how services are being delivered. And that's one of the areas that the task force will be taking forward. And that's why we have a member from uh, the actual managed clinical network on the task force to support that work as we develop the new national standards for adults who have been experiencing sexual violence. Ben McPherson to be followed by Ross, by John Finney. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary has stated, the right to choose the gender of the person who conducts medical examinations is key to ensuring an appropriate and sensitive approach to victims of rape and sexual assault. Therefore, how has the analysis of the 2016 survey of, the, of female doctors informed next steps for increasing the number of female doctors carrying out such examinations? Cabinet Secretary. So, enough, so the purpose of the survey that we carried out was to try and identify what the barriers were to female doctors participating in the training programme uh, to conduct uh, forensic medical examinations. Um, we are very encouraged by the 800 responses which we have received, um, uh, with uh, almost three quarters of those being uh, from female doctors. Analysis of that work is still ongoing. Uh, once we have completed that analysis, we'll then be able to identify whether there are any further measures that need to be taken forward in order to encourage more uh, female physicians to participate in the forensic medical examination programme, which is available through NHS Education for Scotland. Uh, and once we've completed that work, we'll then be able to look at how we can address that within individual board areas. What I can assure the member of is that it's very clear that there is a level of clinical interest in undertaking this work. What we need to do is now harness that uh, and to make sure that we increase the number of females who are qualified to carry out these forensic medical examinations. Uh, and I've got no doubt uh, that once we've analysed the survey work, we'll be in a position where we can take immediate action uh, to address some of the areas of concern in order to increase the number of female doctors who are qualified to carry out these examinations. John Finney to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the early sight of his report. Cabinet Secretary, you talked about the survey, and you'll be aware that it's an issue not just only of recruitment of forensic medical examiners, but also retention. You'll also be aware of the report the Justice Committee did in the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and the specific evidence we had on this subject from four medical examiners, one who said he's, uh, and I quote, uh, been cited to attend court between five and 20 times a month, but called to court only a handful of times a year. Would you encourage the Crown Office representative on the task force to not await a broader response to the, the Justice Committee's report, but to pursue issues that will secure the, the retention of medical uh, forensic examiners, not least because the BME tell us that there are faced with frustration a number of clinicians who are opting out of court service. So perhaps the greater use of minutes of joint agreement, because it's not just about recruitment, it is about retention. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, John Finney raises a very important point and a very valid point, uh, and I made reference to that in an earlier comment about the need to make sure that the model which we take forward is one which is sustainable. It's not about just recruiting some more doctors at the present moment who can conduct uh, the forensic medical examinations. It's about making sure that we have a continuous flow of clinicians who are prepared to carry out this work uh, on an ongoing uh, basis. That's why one of the uh, task force's uh, uh, subgroups is on the issue of workforce planning. Uh, and that's why I'm reluctant to give uh, a, an end date to when the task force will complete its work, because we need to make sure that we're undertaking detailed work, not just within health boards, but with the Crown, with the police and others, to make sure that we have a sustainable model that delivers the necessary forensic medical examinations, but it does so, it does so in a way which is about making sure women get the right health care support that they require and that clinicians are comfortable with what's expected from them. And that's why planning for that workforce development going forward will be absolutely crucial to making sure the model that we expect to see being taken forward once the task force has completed its work is one which is sustainable and one which delivers the level of service and care that women in these circumstances expect and deserve. 
Liam MacArthur to be followed by Ross Thompson. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement, but more particularly the constructive engagement with Tavish Scott and myself on the particular needs of the communities we represent and the wholly unacceptable situation whereby victims of rape and sexual assault uh, are required to get on a plane and travel south for examinations. I've had further discussions with NHS Orkney and Zelda Bradley from Rape uh, Crisis uh, Orkney. Can you give the reassurance not just about the developments in Shetland, but the situation as of now in Orkney uh, will ensure that no victim will be required um, to go off island uh, for examinations and can he further uh, advise uh, what specific uh, work the task force will be doing to address this, the, the particular um, issues as they arise in Orkney which while part of an island setting like Shetland and the Western Isles will have different uh, challenges and circumstances to meet. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, there is absolutely no doubt the expectation of women to have to wait to leave the island to go onto the mainland uh, to have a forensic medical examination uh, completed is simply unacceptable. Uh, and uh, NHS uh, Shetland have risen to the challenge uh, and uh, clinicians there have committed to uh, carrying out the necessary training in order to be able to provide the necessary services within uh, Shetland. Uh, we already have the service in place in the Western Isles uh, and what we now need is the necessary clinical uh, leadership within Orkney to make sure that we have clinicians with the necessary training to deliver the service uh, on the Orkney Isles. What I can assure the member of is that we want a service which is victim-centred, health-focused, delivering that holistic care that is necessary to women who have experienced a sexual assault or rape. And we expect that to be delivered right across the country and the new national standards will allow us to ensure that whether you're in Orkney or whether you're in Glasgow, the standards that should be expected and delivered by that health board are the same. And I've got no doubt that once we have the new national standards in place and with the work that's been taken forward with the task force, that we'll be able to ensure that in areas such as Orkney, that there is an expectation and that there is the delivery of the necessary services uh, that are required for women who may require to undergo a forensic medical examination. So I can give the member an absolute assurance of our determination to make sure the services which are going to be delivered in Shetland and which are presently being delivered in the Western Isles should also be delivered on Orkney. And a key focus will be to make sure that we deliver that with a victim-centred approach. And I've got no doubt uh, that the new national standards will support us in achieving that. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister has said quite clearly that the Task Force for the Improvement of Services for Victims of Rape and Sexual Assault has a clear mandate and must deliver. Will the Minister commit to return to Parliament to update us um, on the performance of the Task Force and its individual working groups to ensure that it delivers on that mandate? Cabinet Secretary. So, no, sir, I'm more than happy to return to Parliament with a statement once we have the finalised task force report with its recommendations. Uh, apologies to the three members who wasn't able to call. I'm going to end that statement there. We'll move on to our next item of business, which is a statement by John Swinney. We'll just take a few moments to change seats. <laughs>